Welcome everybody to uh, Database DevOps Pipeline. Our goal today is to be able to get schema changes and maybe static data from non-production environments into production environments. Here's the part where I tell you I am definitely going to post the slides on my site tonight. Have you heard that yet today? <laughs> Did they do it? Yeah, that drives me nuts as well, which is why these slides are online right now. Achievement unlocked. Woo! Let's head to robrich.org, robrich.org. We'll click on presentations here at the top and we'll cruise down to a database DevOps pipeline. Here's the slides, they're online right now. Here's the code that we're gonna look, like, look at. It is also online right now. Click on the code link and you can get to the code that we're gonna see today. It is there online right now. Oh, and I tweeted about it if you wanna click on there. While we're here on robrich.org, let's click on About Me and see some of the things that I've done recently. Oh, I have not pushed refresh. There we go. I'm a developer for a global nonprofit. Uh, Microsoft and Docker have given me some awards. Uh, I'm a friend of Redgate, and AZ Give Camp is really fun. AZ Give Camp brings volunteer developers together with charities to build free software. We start building software Friday after work. Sunday afternoon, we deliver that completed software to charities. Sleep is optional, caffeine provided. If you're in Phoenix, come join us for the next AZ Give Camp. Or if you'd like a Give Camp here in India, then find me here at the event, or find me on LinkedIn, or Twitter, or Mastodon, and let's get a Give Camp in your neighborhood too. Some of the other things that I've done, I got to work on this book, Pro Microservices in .NET 6, that was really cool. SQL Source Control Basics, we'll take a look at some of the principles from there. And uh, one of the things that I'm particularly proud of, I replied to a .NET Rocks podcast episode, they read my comment on the air, and they sent me a mug, woo! -hoo! So there's my official trophy, and if you'd like a .NET, no, I'm just kidding. So let's take a talk about a database DevOps pipeline. So first let's talk about a DevOps pipeline. A DevOps pipeline, our goal is to build reliability, consistency, reduce cost. We create that automation so that we can start to create very predictable results from our build process. So yeah, automate all the things! <laughs> because computers are cheaper than people. Now that wasn't always the case. There were a time when we'd take our punch cards and we would flip through the punch cards and we'd think through the process in our head. And that was so that we didn't have to waste that time on that really expensive computer that we were probably using in the middle of the night because no one would give us access to it except for that. That day is not today. Today, it is faster to run the tests on the server, run the tests on my local machine, than to try and think through all the scenarios again. We create this automation because computers are cheaper than people. So here's a DevOps pipeline. Now the cool thing about this DevOps pipeline is that we can kind of think of it from all perspectives. Is this an application? Is this a mobile app, a desktop app, a web app? That's kind of a, not, a good analogy for all the things. Now one of the things that you'll notice about this DevOps pipeline is it starts with customers and it ends with customers. Our job as developers is to deliver customer value. We do that by starting with customers and ending with customers. If your DevOps pipeline doesn't include customers, I would invite you to revisit that DevOps pipeline to be able to get those users embedded in your system. Okay, so we start with a, an idea from a user. We'll stick that in a backlog, and then when the developer is ready to pick up that task, then they'll code that task, commit that to source control, and up kicks the build. So the build does its thing, and when the build finishes, it'll run some tests, validate the software, it might deploy it to a pre-production environment where we do some additional tests. Are those people, are those machines? And once we get the thumbs up that that build is good, then we will deploy it into production and deliver customer feedback to deliver value to users. Those users will give us feedback and we can use that to be able to schedule additional work. Here's our DevOps pipeline. The cool thing about a DevOps pipeline is, let's say for example, we get a failing test. 
okay, let's stop the pipeline at that step. We'll take that feedback and we'll use that to be able to build different code. So at that point, the developer can say, well, you know, yeah, I probably should code this a little bit differently so that that test passes. And once that test passes, we can do some really interesting things. We probably have a dashboard of how we deploy it and we get some really elegant results. Now that's the state of the art for applications. What's the state of the art for deploying databases? It's two in the morning, I'm tired, but this is when the system was on least use. So I log into the production server. Is that the production server? Is that the test server? I don't know. Is that the window I had left open from last time? I run some scripts. I don't know. Are those the scripts? Are those all the scripts? Did they run before? I don't know. Um, I'm tired. This is, how are we doing at this automation thing? This is state of the art for databases. This is probably what we do today. Stay up late, run scripts of questionable origin, and, well, make mistakes. What if we could do it differently? What if we could take the same principles that we use for our DevOps pipeline for applications and apply those to databases? What if we could have a build process for databases? Well, what kind of things might we have in our DevOps pipeline? Well, we probably have a, a build process. We're probably running some tests. Um, oh, <laughs> I jumped ahead. So a typical DevOps pipeline for databases today is we'll remote into that uh, server, we'll run some scripts. We'll, uh, are those scripts already run? Did we run all of them? Did we run them twice? Did we run them in the right order? Uh, we're tired. This is a very manual process. We're not really doing some great work here. Yeah, we got the thing deployed, hopefully. Hopefully it didn't blow up, but let's see if we can do better. So databases are different. Now with the DevOps pipeline for applications, as we run each build, we can just blow away production and create a new environment and upload our new version of our application. Can we do that for databases? It turns out our users get a little grumpy when we delete their data. Let's not do that. Let's not delete the production database when we deploy a new version. We need to care for data as we transition these states. We need to migrate our data between the different schema states. So uh, there are also other environments that we need to care for as we start talking about database DevOps pipelines. Production, yeah, definitely. Pre-production servers, uh, dev and QA, but also developers as well. Now, we probably don't even think of a developer workstation DevOps pipeline, but let's kind of think through that. What does it look like for an application? Well, for an application, the developer DevOps pipeline is git pull run build. That's really easy. You know, that totally works for a DevOps pipeline for applications. What does it look like for a database? Well, if we have some schema changes, then we're pulling down the scripts. Hopefully we have those in version control. We need to make sure they run them in the right order. Then we'll probably mutate the data to match the thing. And, and well, you know, that's for schema changes. What if we want data? Well, now we go ask the DBA for some, uh, a production backup. And of course, the DBA is busy, so you know, we have to wait. And then we wait some more. And then we pass through the DB, oh, wait, no, I'm doing this production thing. I, and so we wait some more. Then we pass through the DBA and we're like, hey, can I have the data? He's like, okay, fine. Let me put aside production, because of course you're important. And let me restore some, uh, let me back up some production data. And then, we, then I can restore it into place. And okay, now I have the latest schema as of that version. 
Now I go run all of the database scripts again, and, and hopefully I run them in the right order, and I'm massaging the data. You can see how the DevOps pipeline for databases is a little bit more complex, even if we're just talking about a local development environment. We need to care for that customer data as we transition between these states. How are we doing? You know that, that, that um, guy who was really tired? Yeah. We are not automating anything yet. <laughs> the whole point of a de de DevOps pipeline is that we have this automation process that just runs and does all the things. So let's take a look at what we're looking for. So the typical database DevOps pipeline is manual. It's people remoting into servers and doing stuff. Instead, let's create a database pipeline that is automated. Now we can't just blow away data, we need to transition it in the states. We need to care for customer data as we transition it. So let's take a look at a database DevOps pipeline. Now in our pu previous pipeline, we had users and then we did a build and the test and so, yeah, we had this process. We get the latest version, we version our assets, write the version number somewhere, we build it, we test it, and we deploy it. If all of those things work, then we've got our latest thing. Oh, and by the way, let's automatically do that on every change. On every change, get the latest version, Version our assets, write that version number somewhere. Build, test. Now we want to do all of those steps in a neutral environment. We haven't touched production yet. Because if any of those fail, we want to stop. But if all of those succeed, now let's go deploy to production, and now we have our new version in production. So let's take a look at a database DevOps pri pipeline for databases. <coughs> Automatically on every change, get the latest version, write the version somewhere, build, test, all in a neutral environment. We haven't touched production yet. If it succeeds, deploy. Wow, that's um, exactly the same. Okay, let's unpack this a little bit because um, what does build mean when we're talking about databases? How do I build a database? Well, we can start with either a blank database or uh, last night's production database backup. We can restore that in a place. We can run the migrations that we have. And then we can run our tests. Now, maybe these are unit tests against our database. Maybe we're running uh, SQL commands. Or maybe we're running our applications integration tests. That's what a build and test looks on, like on a database. Restore a database or start with a blank database, run all the database migrations, and then validate that our application works. Hey, you know what's really cool? We just practiced a production deployment every time we kicked off a build because we started with last night's production database backup. Hey, that's pretty cool. By the time we get ready to deploy to production, the DBA is going to say, hey, have you run these scripts? Do they work? And it's like, yeah, um, check out my dashboard. I, I ran this a bunch of times. It works out great. That's awesome. So as we start talking about the build and test process, we'll talk about database migration scripts. Now, unpacking database migration scripts, there's two methodologies that we can use here. There's a state-based approach, and there's a migrations-based approach. So the migrations break into migrations and something else. Yeah, you know that umbrella that's called like unit tests? And under unit tests, we have unit tests and integration tests. And yeah, like that. <laughs> we have two main methodologies, uh, state-based and migration-based. In a state-based approach, we have create scripts, and we will change those create scripts over time. By comparison with a migrations-based approach, we will have migration scripts, and each script will describe one set of changes to get it from one state to another. 
But let's take a look at each of these approaches because they're a little bit different and they have their pros and cons. In a create script approach, we'll have a whole bunch of scripts. So here's all my scripts. I have a customer and a product and an invoice. Here's a view. And each script, let's pop open the customer script. It is the create script for that object. Now that's cool. As our schema changes, we'll modify this file. So now our git blame works great. We can pop open git blame. We can see when did this file change. We can watch all of the things change. We can know which change occurred when. But as we go to deploy this, we need a, a, an engine that can infer the difference between this. Let's take a look at this SQL directory and that database, and let's compare them. And let's infer what the SQL script will be to be able to get from here to there. So it takes that pretty robust engine to be able to look at one and infer the changes to the other and then run them. And this is cool. Uh, by comparison, here's migration scripts. Now in migration scripts, we have this directory of all of the files and each file represents one change. So here's the change that I did in this case on uh, January 2nd, and then here's another one on January 4th and January 10th. Popping open one of those scripts, we can see that we're modifying one table, we're modifying a second table, we're changing some data. This is really cool. We can describe exactly what we need to get from here to there. Now the cool part is, now we just need to keep track of which scripts we already ran and run the ones that we haven't run. So we might create a table in our database that just lists the scripts that we've run. Maybe it also includes the hash of the scripts. Maybe it includes the uh, down script of how to remove this if we want to get really fancy. But we're just kind of keeping track of the ones that we ran. And if we haven't run it yet, then we'll run it. And there's our migration script. So let's compare these. Creation scripts. On the upside, we have really great Git history. We can take a look at the files and we can see exactly when they changed. On the downside, we need a much more robust engine to be able to compare these. We can't just exactly say, hey, let's take a look at this one and this one and imply the difference. So what if we split a table? Well, in this create script methodology, the create script just, it doesn't know that we changed the table. It only knows that this table used to exist here and now this other table exists there. So it'll take this table and it'll drop this table It'll create a new table and it'll go <laughs> And then with that new table, then now the table is empty. Where did our customer data go? Yeah, in this create scripts methodology, we just dropped data as we were doing some of these more advanced scenarios. Oops. By comparison with the migration scripts, we know exactly what we want to do. So we can just go from here to there unless somebody modified something in production. Now, we have to start at a known spot to be able to get where we need to go. Did somebody just log into production and create something or modify something or uh, somehow do the thing that we're about to do? Now my migration script won't fit. Uh, with create scripts, we could infer the difference and remove this drift on each deploy. With migration scripts, we have to assume that the database didn't change. But on the upside, we can take exactly the path that we needed to, kind of. We're taking the path that the developer took. So I, um, I took this table and I created this new column and then uh, I renamed the column because I thought, nope, let's rename it back, that didn't work. Uh, so, well, now I'll just throw away this table and I'll create a new, we're creating this path and as we run these migration scripts, we need to take the exact same path the developer took, meandering all over, the part, all over the way. Now if these tables lock during this process, and we're running a couple of different iterations on this, we may spend more time locking our data and doing these migrations than we need to. By comparison, in the create scripts, we could take the most direct path so yeah, each one has its pros and cons. So let's do a hybrid approach. What if we did the best of this and the best of that? What if we had create scripts, but if ever we had hard stuff, we'd do a few migration scripts? 
Or what if we had migration scripts, but we also wanted to keep the state and, and mutate those state files from time to time so that we still get that artificial, uh, so that we still get that git diff history so that we can know when changes happen. That's really interesting. Now, arguably, it's the best of the both worlds, or it's the worst of both worlds. We need that intense diff engine, but we also need the uh, migration scripts, and then we also need to keep track of the migration scripts that we ran, and then we need to know, should we diff first, should we diff second, have we run the script? Maybe the hybrid approach is the worst of both worlds. So ultimately, there isn't a great story here. Uh, you can pick the one that you um, distaste least, but each of them have their strategies. So I definitely don't want to take an opinion on what tools we use, but here's a bunch of tools that we can pick from. The cool part is as you grab these slides from robrich.org, you can click on each of these to learn more about that particular database product. Now in Create Scripts, we have some tools to be able to automatically dump schema and infer schema. So uh, uh, SQL Source Control is a really elegant tool. We'll use that one where we can take a look at this and just uh, diff our database against the schema directory and write those files into place. Uh, we'll also take a look at Flyaway, which is really interesting, where we just keep track of interesting files and we'll just run those files into place. But ultimately, I don't want to take an opinion on the files, so find the one that makes you happy and use that one to be able to leverage your database. Now one more piece as we start looking at tools, you might want to look for vendor agnostic tools or vendor specific tools. Now vendor specific tool is really great because you can get into all the nooks and crannies and get really high fidelity details on the database. Is that um, view or a statistic or an index, you can be able to uh, script out all of those things but only for that one database vendor. So if you have multiple types of databases, you might need multiple tools. By comparison with a vendor agnostic approach, you might have one that plugs in databases, and so now you can just take a look at the database that you need and be able to apply this more universally. But it may not be able to catch file permissions or uh, object permissions or some of the more uh, esoteric um, data types it might get those wrongs in some places. So take a look at the tools and understand the limitations of the tools that you choose. So no matter what we pick, we're back to this build process. Are these state-based? Are these migration-based? We'll get to see some of each. On every change, get the latest, write the version somewhere, build, test, all that in a neutral environment. If that works, to play. That's our build process for applications. That's also our build process for databases. So let's take a look at this. We're going to do a database build process with um, containers for uh, state-based. We'll also do for migrations-based. We'll also do it locally, and we'll also do it in the cloud. So the cool part here is we have migrations-based, we have state-based, we also have cloud-based builds, and so you can grab e that code today to be able to dig into all of these things. Let's take a look at um, starting out in the migrations, uh, nope, starting out in the state-based, let's take a look at build.ps1. So I'll start in PowerShell. Now here in PowerShell, I'm going to start by saying error action preferences stop. So you know, if you get a non-zero status code, crash this script too, that's going to be good. Let's set our SA password. We'll start up this uh, Docker Compose file. Now this Docker Compose file will start a database inside containers. This is really cool. We want to start in a neutral environment, and this Docker Compose file can definitely do that. OK, so now let's go pound that database and wait for it to wake up. We'll just say select star from databases. Once that starts up, now we know that we're good to go. Next, let's create a test database. So I'm going to say, if not exists, go create that database. And so now I have a database to work with. 
Now, I set that SA password in the top of the script, so now I know what that artificial database is. Now let's run this comparison. So I'm going to take the SQL scripts from this, um, where did they go? There we go. Here's, nope, that's the migrations one. Here it is. So I've got uh, this one that says create that table, this one that creates that table, this one that adds some Oh, that's not it. Um, and so we'll run the data scripts, and then we'll run the, or the schema scripts, and then the data scripts. And then we'll version our assets. Now, I've got this setting table, and the setting table just has various information in it. I'm going to write um, the git hash and the build date. So that's my way of versioning this database. I know when I created it. I know what the Git version of it was. So I know if there's any problem, how to get back to that version to be able to do that. OK, so let's write those values into the data store. And then let's run our app tests. So I'm just going to select the data, make sure the data was in place. That's really cool. And then I'm going to go build my application. So here's my application. And I've got this. Um, to do a repository that will run some SQL things. I've got the SQL helper that will help me do that. And so I just want to run some integration tests here on my database. So here's some integration tests. Let me go get all from the database. I just want to validate that that result is not null. Let me get by negative one and uh, um, validate that that is null. Let me just run some integration tests for my application. Now, the cool part is I'm using containers for my application. So let's go build that, and then let's go run that. And I'll inject the database connection string here in place. Now, this is interesting. I am going to run this particular stage, the test stage. So let's pop open that Docker file for this application. And we can see that it's not like the Docker file that we're used to. But I have this additional stage, this test stage, where I'm not running this at build time, I'm running this at run time, and that's so I can inject in this connection string. Therefore, I can run that against the database that I just spun up three lines ago and be able to validate that this database works in this neutral environment. Perfect. So I'll build it, I'll test it, and then, now that I've done all of the build, test, and version in a neutral environment, I will take down my test database, and then let's deploy it to our production database. Now, I didn't set these environment variables, so, uh, but we can see that it's going to do the schema compare and the data compare against our production database. We'll version those assets, and now we've deployed our database version into production. So let's do that. I'm going to say build.ps1, and so it'll start that local database running inside of a container, this neutral environment. We definitely want to build in a neutral environment. OK, now that we've got that, uh, oh, the database is still coming up. I love that it does these dots here where it just says, hey, I tried once. It wasn't up yet. Let me try again. OK, now we've started the database running inside of a container inside of our uh, CI process. OK, once we've got our database running, <laughs> I love how it upgrades it there. That's cool. OK, so now we've got our database up and in place. We've verified that we can connect to it. So let's run our comparison. Now, we start off by comparing this. Oh, looks like we need to add three new tables. Makes sense. We started out with empty. We needed to have three tables in this version. We'll do the same thing for data. Uh, yep, we've got our lookup data. We've also got our things. There's our build date and our git hash. Now let's build our application, run our application's tests. Yep, that works as well. Excellent. And then it says, hey, I didn't set the deploy variables, so I can't deploy it. Yep, that's fine. We just ran a database DevOps pipeline in a completely automated way in a neutral environment where we didn't need a magic server. We didn't need to worry about, is that uh, server going to get cleaned up right? We just spun up a container in the middle of our DevOps pipeline. Perfect. So that was state-based. Let's do a similar thing where we switch that from uh, PowerShell to Bash. If we're doing this on Linux, maybe we've got a Linux build agent. But we'll do basically the same thing. Docker compose up in the background. 
Let's wait for it to start up. Let's uh, create the database if it doesn't exist. Let's run our schema compare and our data compare. Let's version our assets, run our app tests, um, building that particular stage, and then running that stage, injecting in the connection string. Then let's Docker compose down. We've done that in a neutral environment and everything worked. Now let's deploy it and uh, deploy it into our production scenario. Cool. Completely automated, state-based. Let's do a similar thing with a uh, migrations-based build. So in a migrations-based build, we're going to do this uh, with Flyaway. So here in our migrations-based thing, we have various um, create scripts. This one's going to create the task status table and fill it with data. Then next, I'll create the to-do table. Let's create the setting table and fill it with data. Oh, I forgot the create date in the to-do table. We can create that as a different script. That's excellent. So let's start up our Docker Compose file, wait until our database is running, create our database if it doesn't exist. Now we're using the Flyway container, injecting in the um, Flyway, uh, the SQL folder that we have right there. It will run migrate. Here's our connection string off to that database that we just invented with the password that we set at the top of the script. We'll version our assets running that update script. We saw that before. Let's run our database migration, our uh, database tests by running our applications integration tests. Clean up. Then let's deploy this to our production server. That looks really familiar. Yeah, the only difference between a state-based thing and a migrations-based thing is what is the command line that we use to call the server. Cool. So how might we do this in the cloud? Well, let's flip over to a um, cloud-based thing. So here's our, um, not that one, this one. Our state-based approach inside of GitHub Actions. Now the cool part about GitHub Actions is that we can spin up databases inside of our uh, build process inside of GitHub Actions. So we can just create the services, and we can say, I would like it to be a Postgres one, here's my image, and uh, here's my thing, and then we can just connect to it and everything works great, with the exception of I could not get this to work at all. <sighs> so I flipped over to using Spawn, and Spawn is really cool because it's this API for creating test databases, spawn.cc. Now the cool thing about Spawn is I can just call into this API saying, hey, I just need this test database. Uh, I only need it for 10 minutes. Let me run some build stuff. So let's go do that. Now I have here the tables inside this Azure database and I don't have any of them yet, which is cool. So let's go do that build. Now I created my data image and then my data container. They use similar paradigms as Docker. So a Docker image and a Docker container. Here's my database image and then my database container. I might choose to use a database image as last night's production database backup. Our production backup is only as good as the last time we restored it. I'm gonna restore it on every build. If my build fails, maybe it's because last night's backup is corrupted. That would be a really good thing to know before, say, a disaster struck and it's been corrupted for months. Okay, so let's go create an image. We'll create a container from that. In this case, I'm just going to create an empty uh, SQL Server 2019. And then let's run, this looks really familiar. Let's create the database if it doesn't exist. Let's migrate the data into place. Let's version our assets. I basically just took that script and I pasted it into place here inside GitHub Actions. Now, that could work okay. We might as well even just call build.sh at that point. But we're injecting in all of these environment variables based on the details that we got out of Spawn. Now, it's going to automatically randomly generate usernames and passwords and ports. So we'll definitely need to capture that. 
But I'm going to take it a step farther and kind of make it more GitHub Actions-y. So uh, I'll still do that spin up the spawn and create the data image and the data container, create the test database. I'll just use the MS SQL tools Docker image here, which is perfect. Here's my entry point, SQL CMD, and I'll run this command specifying all of the um, details that I got from spawn. I'm going to migrate my database. Now I chose to use the SQL compare container here rather than just doing it inline. Now I don't have to have any tools on my build agent. I'm just using containers from other places. That's excellent. SQL data compare will get my static data into place. I'll go grab the current date because I need to be able to do this in bash. I can't exactly do this inside of args here. It just presumes that this is static. So let me go get that date and then I'll update the build date with the build date and the git hash with the git hash and then I'll run my app tests and uh, or rather I'll build my uh, let me output some stuff then let me build my thing and then run my thing now I'm specifically not using the docker syntax here because I'm building the image and so it doesn't exist yet If I were to specify the Docker image here, it would try to reference it and it would fail the build because I haven't built it yet. And that's why I just say Docker run here. Okay, so the build succeeded. Now let's run our, um, let's, now that we've done that in a neutral environment and everything worked, Let's now push that into our production server. And so now I'm using secrets from GitHub Actions. Now this is cool. Here in GitHub Actions, I created a bunch of secrets. And so I have secrets specifying the database that I wanted to deploy to and the username and password and the spawn token. And so I can just go reference those secrets from here and now I'm deploying into production. Perfect. So I'll deploy that content and uh, version my database, and then I'll also go clean up my spawn container. Now, uh, I specifically started out by saying my database will only exist for 10 minutes, but cleaning it up when I'm done is a good net citizen. And I'm specifically going to do this if always, so that even if my build fails, my temporary database will also get cleaned up. Yeah, I could probably do this here before I deployed, but eh. I want to get it into production as quickly as possible. So there's the state-based one. We could also look at a migrations-based one, which is, for the most part, exactly the same, with the exception that I'm using the flyaway container instead of the SQL compare and data compare containers. Cool. So let's fire that up in production. We saw how we don't have any tables in production yet. And so let's come in here to our GitHub Actions. And let's run this migrations-based DevOps pipeline. Run that. I love that here in GitHub Actions, if you specify uh, workflow dispatch, you get that go button. Now, I specifically chose to comment out the push, but you probably want those. I just didn't want it to kick off every time I uh, committed. Instead, I wanted to be able to push the button as part of this uh, experience. So let's go into that DevOps build, and we pull all of our containers. Excellent. Now let's go create the database. Much like um, it took a while to spin up our uh, local container of our database, it will take a little bit to create that data image inside of Spawn. It's doing some magical stuff. Have you ever tried to install SQL Server? And you know how long that takes? Like an hour? Have you ever tried to walk somebody through that over the phone? <laughs> okay, okay, D down one, uh, nope, nope, uh, uh, okay, click on that one. Nope, nope, go back a page, N down one, D scroll down some more. And I just passed in an API and it went and created an image for me, a database, that is so cool. So um, I chose to do this with SQL Server because SQL Server is really painful to automate, 
But if you're using Postgres or using MySQL or even if you're using a NoSQL database like Mongo or Redis, you can do a similar type of mechanism there. There's similar tools. But if you can do it on SQL Server, you can definitely do it on those other tools as well. Uh, MySQL dump and Postgres dump is really cool at being able to create migration scripts, by the way. Okay, so we created the data image. Let's create the data container. I'm still amazed that it can spin up a database in just you know a matter of uh, half a minute or uh, a few seconds. That is just really cool. Okay, get us a database. Get us a database. I've tried to do that, walking people through the um, installing SQL Server over screen share. It is painful. I'm just like, request connection to your mouse. Can I just do it? Okay, so we're gonna take a look at uh, doing the migration. Yep, we've uh, created those three tables. Very nice. Uh, created the fourth table. Let's set our date in place. Let's run some migration scripts. We're building our, uh, yep, there's our git hash in our database so we know what version our database is and when we built it. So now we're building our application, .NET restore, .NET build. Yeah, I, I, um, from time to time, I like to actually run the .NET test here, um, run my unit tests but I pass in a filter saying, but not integration tests, therefore I can do the integration tests here. Now we'll probably also wanna build the other stages. In this case, I just wanted to be able to, oh, hey, we got three passing tests in our application. Woohoo! our database worked. In a neutral environment, now let's go deploy it to production because we validated this in this neutral environment. So let's go connect to our uh, database in the cloud, and we have a green build. That's cool. Let's come back over to our database. Let's refresh, and now we've got those three tables in place together with our which schemas did we write. So let's edit the data, select the data. Really, I want to... Okay, you're gonna make me do it this way. Oh, there we go. Let's run that. Oh, now that I've run it 12 times. Run. There we go. So it was built right now. Here's the git hash, 12DDAA. And if we come back to our uh, database, our uh, thing, we can see 12DDAA is the version of our application. And so we were able to deploy this schema and static data in a very automated way. That was cool. Now the cool part, whether you choose to do it on-prem or in the cloud, whether you choose to do it with a state-based or a migrations-based, you have all four examples here that you can use to be able to fork and use in your code or uh, use this as inspiration to be able to build a similar mechanism for another tool. Any questions on the build and deploy that we just did? Cool. Yes. Why don't we rely, uh, why can't we rely only on uh, database migration scripts rather than having this table script uh, together with a migration script? So what normally happens uh, in production environment that we create uh, uh, scripts, sprint by sprint, let's suppose, whatever database or schema changes there. Right. Yeah, why can't we just do migration scripts? Why do we also need create scripts? I agree, I did four builds in this one repo. That is too many. Pick the one that you want and delete the other three. If you're only doing migration scripts, then yeah, use the migration scripts to get out, where you're, uh, get out the results that you want, but keep track of the scripts that you ran and use a tool to be able to run the scripts that you haven't.
Good call. Uh, Yeah, we could use similar things to be able to infer the difference between our scripts. So um, in my script, I just said, where's my migration space? There we go. I just said, go create the table. So I'm assuming that the table doesn't exist. Right. In those circumstances, you may have to rely on migrate scripts only, but uh, beyond a certain stage, the life cycle, right? It depends. Now, the cool part is, um, in this case, I started with an empty database. So yeah, I had to build up the entire thing. But if I started with last night's production database backup, most of those tables already exist. If I'm using a create-based approach, then I will look at my scripts folder and I'll look at my database, and I'll notice which ones are the same and which ones are different. And if they're different, I will infer that migration script that I need to run to be able to make them the same. But yeah, I'm not starting over at zero and building all the way up. I should start with last night's production database backup. In this case, I didn't have last night's production database backup, so I started with an empty database. But I agree, if migrations scripts make more sense for your organization, make more sense for your preferences, then by all means, that's a great strategy. Uh, one more question related to this uh, restoring uh, uh, database from production backup. So what happens normally is like uh, backup which we take or over the cloud or on the network as well. So that is quite behind like five, six, seven seconds, let's suppose, is behind what the current database is. So, so how can we mitigate that? Let's suppose I have a backup like which is uh, which has been uh, backed up uh, ten seconds before, and within ten seconds we have I have let's suppose ten uh, new rows which are inserted into the database. So, is there any way that we can mitigate this? Yeah. So if it takes a really long time to restore last night's production database backup, I say take the one that finished last night. You know. I'm not trying to back up the database in production as part of this build. I'm just assuming that that asset exists, and I'm just restoring it into place. But yeah, in real world, we'll have to stop the traffic in order to like, uh, restore current version of uh, production or making it yeah. equivalent. Yeah, if I'm restoring the entire production database into place, that might take a considerable amount of time, and that might be uh, cost prohibitive inside of my uh, DevOps pipeline. There's tricks to be able to have warm databases that I can restore there. Uh, completely separate talk, but I agree. You know, the process of being able to take that production database backup and shrink it appropriate for a DevOps pipeline is quite the art. And so, you know, uh, for a pre-production environment, we probably don't want to shrink it at all. For a developer's database, we want to shrink it a lot. And so, yeah, let's pick the right scripts. And so after the production database finishes, let's restore that database, let's shrink it appropriate to each environment, bake that data into a container, not a volume. And then when it comes time to be able to launch this build, now we didn't have to create the database, we could just start that container, the database is already running. Yeah. Um, in this case, for our build, we didn't use volumes because we wanted to be in that neutral environment where we could break things and not break sacred environments. But then once the build is done, yeah, using volumes for your data is great because now you can stop that production container, uh, take a snapshot of that data, store it elsewhere, and then uh, play the container again and you're ready to go. Yeah, great approach.
rollbacks. That is really cool. Now, in both the state-based and the migrations-based, there's really cool support for rollbacks. In this case, I said um, migrate up, but as part of creating flyway scripts, I can also create a down script you know, to undo this. And so you can say, OK, so I went to go roll it up, and that failed. Let me run the down script instead. Here's the concern, though. I rolled it up, and it failed. I'm now in a not great state. So now I'm going to run the down scripts and hope those succeed. But what if those fail? <laughs> now we're in a really fragile spot. I would argue that we probably don't test our down scripts very much. And the process of rolling back is fragile enough that I would say if the database update fails, I did it in this neutral environment, which kind of proved that it would work. If it still fails, I need to get a person to come fix this. I'm not going to auto roll back because now I'm in an even worse state. That's you know the gospel according to Rob, <laughs> but your mileage may vary. If you find success with doing rollback scripts, then that could be great. Couldn't we just take the backup, uh, the previous backup if we had, rather than doing that this Yeah, could we uh, start with last night's production backup and just kind of migrate that and test it out and see if it works? I agree. And the beauty is if we restore last night's production backup into a container, production's over there. If we break this, eh, we throw away the container and production is still fine. Our database DevOps build process. On every change, get the latest, version the assets, build, test, all of that in a neutral environment so you're not breaking any sacred environments. If all that succeeds, deploy. The exact same build process that we would use for our applications the exact same build process we can use for our databases. The database build process. Part of the beauty of doing this, restoring last night's production database backup, is that we're testing that last night's database backup worked. The last time you restore, or the only way to validate that your database backup worked is to restore it, and I restore it on every build. I know for sure if my database didn't back up correctly because my build fails. And that's perfect. Now I know. Now I can take corrective action. And because my build process runs autom automatically, at 2 in the morning when we need to do a database deployment, I'm asleep. I like this a lot. <laughs> it's much more um, automated, much less fragile. We can do a database DevOps pipeline, just like we can do an application DevOps pipeline. Take this code, run with it, and have a lot of fun. Database DevOps, you can do it. Thanks for coming.